I want to go back to a biomarker question. Um, we're going to talk about the APOE genotype at some point, but of course one can actually measure APOE in the plasma. You can actually, just like you can measure APO lipoprotein B, you, which we use obviously extensively in cardiovascular risk stratification. Um, to my knowledge, there's not a commercial uh, assay for measuring APOE, though it can be done. Do you, are you aware of any utility to that? Would that, would, would looking at APOE levels, I read a paper seven or eight years ago, I think suggesting that the lower the level of APOE, the higher the risk, but I, I could, I, I could entirely have that backwards and I could entirely be wrong, but is that something you've, you're aware of at all? Not really. I mean, it's really more about the genotyping than the, the quantification of it, you know, obviously, and again, you've talked about it on prior podcasts, the, um, the risk that E4 genotype carries compared to the others, um, and the fact that E4 homozygotes are, have higher risk, and also different responses to cardiovascular meds, different, um, different risks for other diseases besides dementia. Um, it is typically not something that we check for in the routine day-to-day -day clinical care um, for a couple of reasons. One is it's not diagnostic, right? So you can have E4, E4 and not have Alzheimer's, or you can have E2, E3, which might be protective and still have Alzheimer's. Um, so it really just makes people worry. Um, it does have a lot more utility in the research setting in terms of looking at how carriers versus non-carriers respond to certain treatments um, and helping us understand that carriers, you know, um, may respond differently to different lifestyle interventions, may have an earlier onset compared to people who don't have it, but ultimately end up with the same disease. Yeah. So when people come to see you in clinic, there's not a lot of utility added by looking at it. I mean, my view is APOE4 is great to help people identify risk early on, but at the same time, nobody gets off the hook. And to your, you used a great example. The 2-3 shows up a lot. And I tell my patients with the 2-3, you're not off the hook. Right. You've got about a 10% risk reduction relative to the 3-3, three, three, but the 3-3 three, three is clearly not at risk. Um, and on the flip side, the 3-4 patients or even the 4-4 four, four patients, I say, look, it's certainly not a fait accompli, but I would take this a lot more seriously than maybe you otherwise would right? in terms of preventative measures. So let's go back to the patient that shows up in clinic. Uh, oh, actually, there's one other thing I wanted to clarify. I'm sorry. Let's go back to Lewy body dementia. Most people have heard of this. Uh, there have been some notable uh, examples in the public uh, sphere about you know folks that have uh, died from this. Is it still the case that that's a diagnosis that can be made only post mortem? Um, I mean, again, yes, but it is you know there's this sort of classic clinical picture that is so compelling that you know it it, it can be made fairly accurately in the clinic without diagnostic testing. And so the clinical distinction between, I hate to use this term, the clinical distinction between classic Alzheimer's dementia and classic Lewy body. So let's exclude the mixed variants of that. H how would you differentiate those patients? So classic Alzheimer's, you know, would begin with short-term memory loss and slowly but surely over time progress to having difficulty, you know, paying bills and then eventually um, needing supervision, needing assistance with activities of daily living, cooking, bathing, you know, the, the classic sort of decline. Um, may or may not have behavior issues, may or may not have some changes in walking. Um, Lewy body disease, on the other hand, presents with a fairly classic triad of symptoms that occur within two years of one another. One is an Alzheimer's-like cognitive impairment that can notably fluctuate so that some days people seem really good and some days they seem really, really bad. Um, there is a 
Parkinsonism component where they will often be stiff, have trouble rising from a chair, shuffle. Uh, they may decrease arm swing when they walk so that they walk and, you know, normally when we walk our arms move, but their arms don't move. They may have more, um, less, or I, I should say less expression on their face. Um, they don't necessarily have a tremor. So true Parkinson's disease proper often begins with a tremor, a slow writhing kind of tremor at rest on one side. Um, and often we don't see that in Lewy body disease, but these, they have these other elements of Parkinsonism. And so we've got the, the cognitive impairment, the Parkinsonism, and very often prominent visual hallucinations, um, seeing things that aren't there, fairly elaborate, um, often delusions that go along with it. Um, you know, there's this family living in my house, there's people and bears living in the trees. You know, people will close their blinds because they don't want these people seeing them and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that classic triad of symptoms with some additional supportive features, including restless leg syndrome, um, even many years leading up to it, as well as uh, REM sleep behavior disturbances. So people who often act out in their dreams or a spouse who says, I have to sleep in the other room because he punches me, you know, um, that's sort of a classic Lewy body picture. And, and furthermore, they fluctuate. Both the motor and the cognitive symptoms fluctuate. So today we might be able to go to the mall and walk all around and tomorrow they might have trouble walking across the room. And from the time of diagnosis, Amanda, until those patients are either in hospice or incapacitated or dead is typically how long? Is that a quicker disease? Sometimes. I mean, it's usually about eight years. Um, but for some, it, you know, my experience, I've had a lot of Lewy body patients who have sort of this precipitous decline and then kind of hit a plateau for a while and then really drop off. Um, you know, this is not, this is anecdotal. This is not based on any data, but it's just my experience with them and having seen enough of them to see that that's frequently kind of how it goes. But it's usually about an eight to 10 year process. And there, it's less often as protracted as Alzheimer's can be, even though the average for Alzheimer's is still also eight to 10 years. Um, it can be significantly longer. How hereditary is Lewy body dementia, either with respect to Lewy body itself or being predictive of the next generation's risk for Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's for that matter? Um, I honestly don't know. I don't think it's terribly genetic. You know, we don't have well-established, um, you know, as, as with early onset Alzheimer's, which does have some specific mutations that cause it. I don't know that we know of, of specific mutations for Lewy body disease, but I, I may be just not informed. I mean, that makes in some ways Lewy body a bit more of a mystery because as you said, for Alzheimer's disease on the very early onset side, we have the PSEN1 to APP mutations, which are about as close to deterministic as you get. And then you have the ApoE4 gene, which is not deterministic, but is highly suggestive for the more typical variant. And we also have known risk factors, diabetes, you know, microvascular disease, dyslipidemia. I mean, these things are absolutely known uh, risk factors. Uh, we seem to have none of that on the side of Lewy body, correct? As far as I know, yeah. What's the relative incidence of Alzheimer's versus Lewy body dementia? Is it like eight, 10 to one, or how, how, how much more prominent is Alzheimer's? Um, well, it depends, I guess, if you're looking at, uh, you know, the autopsy confirmed yeah. versus sort of what we see in the clinic. Um, you know, I think that, I, I honestly don't have the numbers specifically for you, but I, I do know that, you know, it's diagnosed less 
but found more on autopsy that people do have Lewy bodies that we may not have expected. I got it. And and just in your experience in your clinic, what's the approximate uh, distribution of those? The, the It's about, I would say, um, you know, 50 to 60 plus percent Alzheimer's, about 20 percent true vascular, about 20 percent Lewy body. And then the rest is FTD and some of these Parkinson's plus syndromes, um, progressive supranuclear palsy, and some of these other less common things that we only see once in a while. So back to kind of the way your practice works, presumably people are coming to you at the referral of a neurologist, correct? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Um, we, we get people referred from their primary doctors. We get people that are self-referred. Um, we get people that are referred by neurology. It, it varies widely. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.